Hello and welcome everyone. Today's presentation is the hemodynamic assessment of volume responsiveness by using PLR. Dynamic indices are increasingly being recognized in intensive care and perioperative medicine for assessing patients' volume and heart status and predicting their response to the fluid administration. These indices are based on the response to specific interventions and their interpretation relies on a deep understanding of the physiological principles. Monet and colleagues provided a historical overview of the fluid responsiveness prediction, highlighting the PLR maneuver as a significant milestone. The PLR maneuver has been extensively studied, validated against fluid bolus administration in various clinical settings, including different patient populations. This video is going to discuss the historical development of PLR, advancements in the data analysis, evaluate the recent studies of the PLR's predictive accuracy and its role in reducing morbidity and mortality when integrated into a goal-directed therapy. It emphasizes the necessity of a new approach to understand and manage cardiovascular functions, introducing the histrocentric cardiovascular model and the 4M concept that is model, mission, means and monitoring. The 4M concept advocates a comprehensive framework to guide clinical interventions, highlighting the importance of a coherent model, clear objective, appropriate methods and continuous monitoring. Criticism is directed towards clinical trials like the CHEST and 6 H studies for lacking a solid conceptual foundation, resulting in inconclusive or misleading outcomes. So coming first to the early studies of PLR in fluid responsiveness. Gaffney in 1952 study observed a minor short-lived increase in the stroke volume during PLR in healthy individuals, which disappeared after 30 to 45 minutes. Wong in 1988 research showed a 3% rise in cardiac index in patients measured 5 minutes after PLR impacting a potential impact on the cardiovascular function. In 1989 study involving simulated hemorrhage in healthy subjects found slight increase in cardiac index and stroke index during PLR despite wide variations in hematocrit and body weight without long term monitoring. Early discussions in these studies focused on the effects of gravitational volume shifts and autonomic responses but did not actively monitor these aspects or delve into the mechanisms like the Starling's law or the threshold increases. Anderson's response to the Wong's highlighted the ultimate goal of volume administration and cardiovascular changes post-injury or hemorrhage should be to enhance the oxygen delivery to the tissue, suggesting an early recognition of the purpose behind the fluid responsiveness. Kyriakids et al. echocardiographic study in coronary artery disease patients found that PLR increased preload and cardiac performance supporting the Frank Starling mechanism. Bolin's 2002 study compared PLR and rapid fluid loading. Nothing significant correlation between the increase in the MAP, stroke volume and cardiac output, attributing changes to potential increase in the mean systemic filling pressures that added the unstressed volume. Monet et al. hypothesized in 2006 that PLR moves venous blood to the intrathoracic compartment, boosting the ventricular preload, although they did not provide a specific definition of what exactly is a preload. Since the early 2000s, there have been significant rise in review articles affirming PLR's effectiveness as a dynamic index for predicting volume responsiveness, surpassing static index size. Surpassing static indices like central venous pressure. The statistical machinery in the interpretation of PLR data. Now, with the introduction of the threshold criteria in the 2006 Monet study, threshold values were set for defining preload responsiveness using parameters like aortic volume flow, cardiac output, cardiac index, and stroke volume. These thresholds help determine whether a patient is likely to benefit from fluid administration or not. Now the ROC analysis was done here, sensitivity and specificity derived from the wartime radar technology was used and the receiver operating characteristics that is the ROC analysis to evaluate the accuracy of the diagnostic tests. ROC analysis helps determine the optimal threshold value that balances true positive rates against false positive rates. Now binary sample space, the threshold value 
creates a binary outcome that is either the patient is volume responsive or not now this is based on whether the increase in cardiac output or stroke volume exceeds a particular threshold or not now clinical significance of all this the threshold is chosen based on clinical relevance that is the minimum increase of cardiac output or stroke volume that we do consider as beneficial and statistical analysis to identify a significant change is the best balance of sensitivity and specificity to predict this particular rise in cardiac output or stroke volume now Yodens index this index represents the optimal threshold when equal importance is given to sensitivity and specificity assuming a 50% prevalence of the condition being tested it's used to identify the best combination of the metrics without considering the cost of different decisions now the methodological dependence the accuracy of these measurements and the determination of the thresholds depend heavily on the methods used such as the transcardiac or transpulmonary thermodilution or pulse contour analysis on the specific of the procedure like the number and temperature of the injectates now prediction versus post prediction the prediction of pre pre load responsiveness is somewhat misleading as the actual analysis is post dates based on previous data so true predictive power needs to be assessed prospectively in new patient cohorts now the roc analysis while roc analysis simplifies the relationship between the volumetric state and the cardiac output into a binary outcome it doesn't account for the nuances of the resistive and the aerotopic states potentially oversimplifying complex physiological relationships now statistical dichotizations and the gray zones statistical analysis divide patients into responders and non responders but introduces a gray zone acknowledging that all all cases are very clear cut and some patients may not definitively fall into any of the either category now the analysis reflects the notion that while individual responses can be unpredictable the overall aggregate data can provide reliable statistical pattern as illustrated by the sellerk homes quote emphasizing the distinction between individuals unpredictability and the predictability of statistics now coming to the interpretation of plr model wise frank starling's mechanism monet and tobul in 2007 highlighted the prevalence of frank starling cardiac function curve in explaining the physiological basis of a plr the curve illustrates the relationship between the stroke volume and a cardiac preload showing that the fluid loading can increase cardiac output by leveraging the preload dependent part of the curve preload sensitivity the frank starling curve is conceptually divided into two segment on the steep initial portion the stroke volume significantly increases with the preload indicating a high preload sensitivity or preload reserve utilization on the flatter terminal portion the additional preload does not substantially increase the stroke volume indicating an absent preload sensitivity now the key question in fluid management and plr analysis is determining where on the frank starling curve the patient heart is operating this determination helps to predict whether increasing the preload through fluid administration will lead to a significantly increased stroke volume or not now the model focuses on heart's efficiency but does not quantify it it also doesn't specify how the fluid contributes to the preload whether through increased volume or the pressure exerted by the volume within the vascular system's compliance volume versus pressure debate that goes on forever there are two main schools of thought regarding the primary driver of circulation the volume centric view advocates like the baird and figel principle argues that the circulation is driven by heart moving the blood volumes between arterial and venous compartments while the cardiac output increases leading to shift in the blood volumes and changes in arterial and right atrial pressures now the pressure centric view 
proponents believe that the pressure differences created by the heart's pumping action are responsible for the blood flow with the guidance model emphasizing the role of pressure in regulating the systemic circulation. Now the relationship between pressure and volume is influenced by vascular beds compliance. In some cases the volume expansion may not enhance the preload if it doesn't affect the gradient of the venous return, potentially explaining why some patients do not respond to fluid responsiveness, which means that if you give fluid, not necessarily the stress volume is rising, at times the unstressed volume can also rise if my compliance is very poor. If my unstressed volume is rising, I will not get an improvement in my cardiac output. Now we need continued testing for PLR maneuver. Now in this, the heart's efficiency is very vital. Studies have shown varying response to PLR based on the heart's efficiency. Thomas's research indicated that subjects with no heart disease significantly increase stroke volume during PLR, whereas those with a historic myocardial infarction had less pronounced increase. Global ejection fraction influence. Size study differentiated response to PLR based on global ejection fraction, finding that patients with higher ejection fraction experienced more significant changes in stroke volume and cardiac output than those with lower ejection fraction, suggesting that the heart's efficiency as measured by global ejection fraction influences the response to a PLR. Now the limitation of the canonical PLR, the standard PLR test does not provide a measure of the heart's efficiency underscoring the need for additional parameters or tests to fully assess cardiac function and fluid responsiveness. The next is autonomic nervous system. The PLR and autonomic nervous system interaction has been studied by Sondergaard et al. and they highlighted that significant interaction between the cardiovascular perturbations induced by PLR and the ANS are seen. During PLR, shifts in central blood volume due to gravitational changes engage both sympathetic as well as the parasympathetic systems, with the balance shifting to restore the central blood volume upon leg elevation. Now, hemostatic maintenance. The study found that while stroke volume increases in response to PLR, indicating fluid responsiveness, cardiac output may not necessarily increase reflecting that the body's hemostatic maintenance would not would need an increased oxygen consumption during the PLR. Schultz et al. examined the ANS response to position changes in patients with severe traumatic brain injury and health volunteers. The findings showed a marked absence of autonomic nervous system response to head tilt in traumatic brain injury, contrasting with significant responses in healthy patients. This difference underscores the importance of autonomic nervous system functionality in cardiovascular response to position changes. Now studies validating PLR. Variability in the threshold for preload responsiveness, there have been many meta-analyses which have revealed the threshold value for identifying preload responsiveness during PLR range from 5% to 16%. This wide range indicates variability in the criteria used to define a significant increase of stroke volume following the PLR. The sensitivity of the PLR, the test's ability to correctly identify the preload responsiveness varies from 0.62 to 1, while the specificity that it is the ability to correctly identify who has not of preload responsiveness ranges from 0.61 to 1. The Yodin index, which combines the sensitivity and the specificity to measure the test's overall efficacy, ranges from 0.41 to 1 across various analyses. Now, the implication, the variability in the threshold values, sensitivity and specificity suggest that PLR, while useful, is not a universally definitive test for fluid responsiveness. The choice of threshold value often determined by the ROC analysis remain a subject of debate among clinicians and researchers. Now the analogy of the 
metrological platinum meter highlights the lack of a universally accepted gold standard for preload responsiveness. The PLR's variable thresholds and diagnostic performance indicate that it is not an absolute measure but rather a tool whose efficacy depends on the clinical context and specific patient criteria. The comparison to choosing a thermometer for cooking illustrates the practical implication of this variability. Just as the incorrect temperature setting can lead to undesirable outcomes while cooking, reliance on PLR with wide range of threshold values could lead to suboptimal fluid management in critically ill patients affecting patients' outcome. Now, results in relation to the model and choice of variable evaluation. Variable choice for preload responsiveness, stroke volume. Some studies prefer using stroke volume as an indicator of preload responsiveness, such as the cutoff of 13 to 15% increase in post PLR indicates a positive response based on the ROC analysis. The other one more commonly used is cardiac output where similar cutoffs are used. Meta analysis so near even split between number of stroke volume and cardiac output studies to assess preload responsiveness. Now, influence of autonomic hemostatic reflexes. Studies assessing cardiac output as a marker of preload responsiveness are often conducted in patients with diminished autonomic reflexes. In contrast, healthy individuals can maintain the cardiac output despite PLR, revealing the differential response between cardiac output and stroke volume in PLR. Now, the clinical implication and the autonomic control. Understanding the interaction between the central hemodynamic variables and the autonomic control during PLR is crucial, especially in patient conditions like sepsis, acute heart failure, and those under anesthesia and sedation, which influences the sympatholytic properties. Now, increase in stroke volume and cardiac output in response to PLR coupled with a decrease in sympathetic nervous system activity might suggest a vasoplegic condition and an increased central blood volume due to pulling in the semi recumbent position and the subsequent increase in the mean systemic filling pressure during PLR is relatively non compliant venous system. And the cautious interpretation of preload responsiveness needs to be done because this term is based on PLR outcomes should be interpreted with caution in terms of deciding whether to give fluids or not. The hemodynamic response might be more indicative for a need to correct vasodilatation rather than merely increasing the fluid volume. Now short and long term outcomes in studies adhering to the PLR guided fluid resuscitation. Now key findings of these studies and meta-analysis are there is a lack of mortality benefit. Several controlled trials did not demonstrate statistically significant difference mortality rates including those in septic patients where PLR is used as a guide for fluid res responsiveness and resuscitation. Now meta-analysis there have been two meta-analysis summarizing the trials conducted similarity the PLR guided resuscitation did not result in statistically significant mortality changes. Now the Zadian meta-analysis which also included 5 studies with 452 patients significantly highlighted the lack of the significant response. Now further studies on survival impact. Dubin et al in 2020 investigated the impact of dynamic indices including PLR on fluid resuscitation and survival, finding no association between PLR and improved survival. Another study examined the survival rate of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients managed with PLR during CPR compared to those in supine, also finding no improvement in survival in hospital discharge or favorable neurological outcomes. Caveats and selected clinical cases. Now, intra-abdominal hypertension and its impact. Mahjob's study highlighted that intra-abdominal hypertension with the defined cutoff of 16 as a significant factor that can negate the positive response to PLR who would otherwise respond to volume expansion. This finding underscores the need to consider abdominal pressures when interpreting your PLR findings. The influence of norepinephrine. Monet's research assessed the effect of norepinephrine on preload cardiac index and preload dependence. Increasing the norepinephrine doses is raised the right atrial pressure cardiac index, indicating the recruitment of the cardiac preload reserves post 
norepinephrine PLR showed a reduced increase in cardiac index compared to baseline, suggesting the norepinephrine decreased the preload dependency. This interaction between vasopressors and preload must be considered while making a clinical decision. The next is heart's efficiency. Jabot and Monet have analyzed in terms of heart efficiency the changes with both studies showing maneuvers that reduced heart efficiency. Such analysis of a deep per understanding of the hemodynamic perturbations, potentially guiding the use of inotropic drugs to modulate the preload responsiveness. Transient nature of the fluid challenges. Messina studied on the pharmacodynamic profile of the fluid challenges infused over different durations showed that effect of flow variability that diminished shortly after infusion ends. This transient nature of the fluid challenges possibly due to stress relaxation mechanism or fluid redistribution raised questions about the lasting impact of a volume responsiveness as an intervention. Speculation on extravasation and hematocrit monitoring. The observations that the effect of fluid challenges can be short-lived with potential redistribution from the central circulation to compliant veins suggests that extravasation might be influenced by mean arterial pressure. This speculation leads to the relevance of monitoring hematocrit levels in assessing fluid responsiveness and the effectiveness of the volume expansion strategy. Now coming to the 4M concept. The model. PLR is conceptualized within a starling oriented framework focusing on preload reserve and volume responsiveness where preload's definition varies across literature often oscillating between volume and pressure. The reliance on CVP and the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure at preload indicator is being increasingly criticized pointing towards a need for more nuanced understanding of the cardiovascular regulation beyond the starling's curve and traditional preload metrics. The next is the mission. The primary goal of the fluid therapy is to enhance the cardiac output but more importantly its main function is to deliver the oxygen and increase the oxygen consumption to maintain a stable internal condition and homeostasis. Now defining the targets for delivery and consumption of oxygen for evaluating cardiopulmonary function capacity to meet this objective considering both micro and micro hemodynamics should be considered. Now the means. Now PLR maneuver involves a gravitational shift of the blood initiated from the central and splanchnic blood volumes to the from lower extremities and then back potentially followed by fluid infusion based on hemodynamic responses. The transient nature of the flow increase from the PLR and subsequent fluid bolus necessitates rapid and reliable flow measurement methods like a pulse control analysis to gauge volume responsiveness accurately. Monitoring Now, monitoring involves short term cardiac output measures often via non invasive PCA due to transient nature of PLR. However, the broad mission of increasing Delivery and consumption of oxygen is less frequently monitored would provide a more holistic view of resuscitation effectiveness. Microcirculatory changes are crucial in context of fluid responsiveness and the impact on tissue oxygenation can be assessed using advanced bedside technology. These can reveal perfusion velocity, capillary density, cellular composition offering insight into the microvascular environment and its response to the therapeutic in intervention. So finally summarizing, we need a comprehensive model. Effective fluid management necessitates a cohesive model grounded in sound physiology which integrates both volume and pressure dynamics. Current models often fall short by not fully accounting for the complexity of the cardiovascular regulation, particularly the interplay between hemostatic mechanisms such as hormonal and autonomic control. Questioning the efficacy of PLR. Despite its intuitive appeal, PLR lacks a robust theoretical foundation, incorporates essential hemostatic control. The introduction of PLR in critically ill patients has not demonstrated improved survival outcomes, highlighting the need for critical reassessment and potential revision of its application. Now, the prerequisites of PLR's utilization. Clear indication and monitoring of the mission to increase the oxygen delivery and the consumption. Consider fluid kinetics in selecting the type of volume to be administered. Harmonizing the threshold values for factors like heart efficacy, patient condition and intra-abdominal pressure. Critical evaluation of sensitivity, specificity and the gray zone in PLR needs to be done. Long term monitoring plan for any increase in DO2 and BO2. 
consideration of autonomic nervous system interaction with PLR response, advocacy of a new paradigm. Guyton's histocentric approach emphasizes the role of tissues in regulating the venous return and by extension cardiac output offers a valuable perspective. This approach advocates for a paradigm that transcends the starling centric model incorporating the volume state, vasoactive and cardioactive states as key determinants in cardiovascular regulation. Now individualized cold direct therapy, the future should be rooted in this as this is a broader paradigm guided by the 4M concept, tailoring to individual patient needs rather than relying solely on epidemiological group norms. Now re-evaluation of the past trials, past fluid management trials should be re-examined through the lens of 4M concept, reassess their implication for critical care, potentially offering new insights on the direction of future research and clinical practice. Thank you for your patience.